Hello, and welcome back to the second part of the Simply Typed Lambda Calculus. In the last video, we introduced simple types for lambda terms, and we showed how to confirm whether a term can have a certain type, and if so, under what assumptions. To express that a term has a certain type, we formed a so-called judgment. On the left side is the context gamma, consisting of assumptions we take over the type of free variables. On the right side, we have a term m, and the type sigma of m. Variables can be given arbitrary types, and more complex terms may or may not have a type depending on the types of the input variables and the structure of the term itself. This yields typable and untypable terms. Regarding this type theory, a few problems arise whose computational complexity is quite interesting. Given a context, a term and a type, the question is whether this term has this type with this given context. This is called type checking. One can actually reduce this problem to the case of only an empty context. Whenever we have a context gamma and some declaration x of type alpha yielding some m of type sigma, we can also ask the question whether the context without this declaration yields lambda x of type alpha dot m of type sigma. If we apply the abstraction rule now, we get the context gamma with x of type alpha yields m of type sigma. So the judgment with only gamma as a context is only true if the changed judgment with one less declaration is true. We can do this reduction continuously until the context is empty. Then again, we might ask whether a term is typable at all, if it's legal. So we want to find a context and a type such that the judgment gamma yields m of type sigma can be derived. This is called well-typedness. Type assignment is a similar concept where not only m, but also gamma is given, and we want to know whether there exists a type for m under this given context. Lastly, we might wonder whether a type sigma is inhabited by a term m, so whether there is a term m which has a type sigma under a given context. For the simply typed lambda calculus, all of these problems are decidable in polynomial time. This is the case for most of the other systems that we're going to look at later on. For an overview over the computational complexity, refer to video 6 on the lambda cube, where we give an overview over these results. Next up, we introduce some terminology and interesting lemmata. The corresponding properties are mostly very intuitive, and so we're going to omit some of the proofs. We start with a lemma about free variables in a typable term whose consequences we already witnessed. For that, we need the notion of the domain of a context, which is just the set of all variables contained in it. The free variables lemma states that if we have a judgment gamma yields m of type sigma, then all free variables of m need to be in the domain of gamma. We saw that already in the derivation of the statement lambda x of type alpha dot yx is of type alpha to sigma for some sigma. During the derivation, we realized that this couldn't be proven with an empty context, and we had to add the type of the free variable y to the context, which was alpha to sigma. We're now going to state three short lemmata without proof only giving an intuition. The thinning lemma states that if we make the context bigger, we don't lose any expressiveness. Now, one might wonder why it's called the thinning lemma, even though we make something bigger, but this is explained quite easily. We thin the strength of the assumptions. By making the context bigger, we assume some declarations that obviously were not needed to yield m of a type sigma. So the statement gamma 2 yields m of type sigma is weaker than gamma 1 yields m of type sigma. With this, we already have an intuition why this lemma might be true. If the first judgment using gamma 1 is derivable, and we extend gamma 1 with additional declarations to gamma 2, then this will have no effect on being able to perform a successful derivation. We can just ignore the additional declarations and derive m of type sigma as we were able to do before. If a term is typable, so is every subterm of it. That is the statement of the subterm lemma. For every legal term m, every subterm is legal as well. This is also quite intuitive. A derivation verifies every part of a type term, so we can extract a derivation for every subterm directly from it. This can be proven via a structural induction with the variable case as a base case and abstraction and application as part of the recursive case. The last observation might seem trivial, but it's very important for the calculus. If we have two judgments that assign to m the types sigma and tau under the same context, then sigma and tau have to be syntactically equivalent, so either they have to be the same type altogether, or they only differ by some parentheses. 
This uniqueness of types lemma tells us that every term has a unique type with respect to a context gamma, if it has one at all. So far, we've not mentioned better reduction or better conversion at all. This is because it works exactly in the same way as it did in the untyped lambda calculus. Simple types mainly influence which terms are legal and which are not. If we have a legal term, we don't need to consider the types when computing. We can simply ignore the type annotations that we have in the abstraction. Keep in mind though that the concept of better reduction only talks about legal terms. Better reduction is not defined for pre-type terms. In the definition of one-step better reduction, only the look of the abstraction changes. This is what the definition for the untyped lambda calculus looked like, and this is the definition with simple types. Many-step better reduction as an extension of the one-step reduction, and better conversion as the extension of the many-step reduction, are defined analogously. In the same way as types don't influence the better reduction, better reduction also doesn't affect the type of a term. If we have a term m1 with type sigma under the context gamma, and m1 can be better reduced to m2, then m2 still has the type sigma in context gamma. This property is called subject reduction. The church rosser theorem also holds in the simply type lambda calculus. Simple types maintain many nice properties from the untyped lambda calculus. A major difference, and actually an improvement compared to the untyped lambda calculus, arises once we look at normalization. In the untyped lambda calculus, we saw that there are terms that are strongly normalizing, weakly normalizing, and not normalizing at all. Let's quickly recall what each of these meant. A term is strongly normalizing if, no matter in which order we reduce a term, we always reach the normal form of the term, which is the point where it can't be reduced any further. Weak normalization only meant that there exists a reduction path that reaches the normal form, but not necessarily all reduction paths do that. In fact, there might be some paths that go on infinitely. And finally, a term is not normalizing if it doesn't have a normal form at all. In the simply typed lambda calculus, every typable term is strongly normalizing. This property is a result of our quite restrictive type system, which by design only allows terms that are strongly normalizing. Although the idea is very easy to understand, the proof is quite involved. You can find one in Lambda Calculi with Types by Barendrecht. So by introducing the intuitive notion of simple types into the Lambda Calculus, we got rid of the problem of non-terminating computations. Another problem tightly connected to that was the possibility of self-application. Self-application is also not possible in the simply type lambda calculus. Assume we have a type sigma for the application of m to itself. Then the derivation rules require that there is some type tau such that m is of that type for one premise and m is of the type tau to sigma for the other premise. This means that m has type tau to sigma and type sigma at the same time. But this is a contradiction to the uniqueness of types lemma. Therefore, there can't be a type for a self-application and any term containing such a construct wouldn't be legal. So now we know what we can't do in the simply typed lambda calculus, but what can we do? The simply typed lambda calculus defines exactly the class of extended polynomials over natural numbers. These are all polynomial functions, so the functions one can construct from the constants 0 and 1 composed with projections, addition and multiplication extended by the conditional operator if0 that we already saw in the untyped lambda calculus. Addition, multiplication, and if0 can be transferred almost directly from the untyped lambda calculus. The same holds for church numerals. Up here we have the nth church numeral, and all other terms copied from our slides of the untyped lambda calculus. We only need to add types. Feel free to check the terms by applying them to some typed church numerals and doing some computation. The consequences of introducing simple types are quite noticeable. For one, all terms are now strongly normalizing, which means that every computation expressible in the simply type lambda calculus terminates, and this is actually a major improvement. But this obviously means that the system can't be Turing complete. We can only compute the extended polynomials. Also, because simple types restrict us from self-application, we can't define recursive functions, so there's no way to define the factorial function. While eliminating non-termination is useful, simple types are way too restrictive not only in terms of what we can compute with it, but also in terms of the power of its type system. So we're going to continue our journey and explore a and couple more lambda calculi in the next videos that extend the concept of simple types to form a more expressive system. 
And we That'll do it for this video. We'll see you in the next chapter. And thank you very much for watching. Have fun.